Um, it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker this evening, Dr. Natalia Ocampo Pinuela, who is an assistant professor at UC Santa Cruz, um, specifically of conservation ecology there. And as a Colombian researcher and avid birder, she has spent over 15 years studying birds in her native Colombia and working to ensure their protection. She uses spatial tools such as maps to inform conservation decisions, and she also studies local conservation issues such as bird window collisions. For two years, she has led the bird resurvey project that she is going to be telling us about this evening. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm sorry that um, we're uh, connected like this. I am on my phone because there was a power outage just five minutes before the talk starts. Um, so it's going to be a little more bumpy than we thought, but you know what, I'm going to talk about expeditions which happen in remote places and under difficult circumstances. So I guess we'll just have to think that we're all in an expedition and that's what we're going to do. Um, and thankfully there are lots of pictures of me in the talk so you don't have to see my face because it's going to be dark here. Um, and also just I hope that the Wi Fi holds for a while because it's probably been powered by a generator so if I cut off and don't reappear my apologies in advance. Okay, so um, thank you to Serena and the San Francisco Bay Bird Observatory for inviting me. I love giving this kind of talks where um, we get to connect with the public and tell a little bit more about our research. And so today I'm going to talk about a very special project, very dear to my heart, um, when we resurvey Colombia's birds after a century. I just want to acknowledge that this talk that I'm giving today is uh, not my individual work, but rather the work of a team. Uh, we call ourselves the Columbia Resurvey Project, and it's a team of um, Colombian scientists and institutions that have gotten together to um, do expeditions on places that were visited a hundred years ago to understand what has happened to our birds. Um, so everything that I will say here is uh, teamwork, and I just want to uh, acknowledge that it's it's not my um, individual work. I also want to um, acknowledge that all the expeditions and everything that I'm going to talk about here has been collected um, and done by um, dozens of Colombian local communities and researchers. And these are the teams, uh, the pictures of the teams of the expeditions that I'm going to talk about today. Um, and so just to um, acknowledge that this is all thanks to all their hard work. And so before we uh, move on, I just wanted to um, compliment a little bit of Serena's introduction of, of me. I consider myself a conservation ecologist. Some call me a closet ornithologist, uh, but I, I really consider myself a conservation ecologist in that I try to uh, inform conservation decisions using tools from um, spatial ecology. So I make a lot of maps of where birds are and where they're gonna be in the future and how we can better protect them by um, creating protected areas, uh, having mixed management strategies and working with local communities to ensure their protection, not just in the present, but also in the future. And I'm very driven by research that is applied. Um, I'm very much um, in, in favor of having my science be used to have a conservation action. I also want to point out that I'm very committed to diversity, equity, and inclusion um, in everything that I do, but especially in academia and in science. And this talk will have um, a, lot, a lot of commentary on that. And so I just want to um, clarify that I'm also deeply committed to that besides just my disciplinary science. So I want to um, talk a little bit about how this is going to go. Um, as I said, I didn't expect to be on my phone, but here we are. Um, but this is not a scientific talk. I'm not going to present scientific results. I'm not going to discuss statistics. Instead, it wanted, I want it to be more of a, an informal conversation where I tell you a little bit about this project that we really have enjoyed um, in these years and so that you learn what we're doing and what we're going to be coming up with in the future. Um, so I'll talk about historical expeditions. And then I'll tell you a little bit about how we did the resurveys and all the things that, all the thought that went into these expeditions and how we um, are hoping to model um, expedition kind of behavior and um, and like logistics for, for the future. And so I'll talk about, or um, sort of like expedition design and what we did. And then I just wanna give a couple warnings. Um, I will be commenting on colonialism and gender bias and ethics um, throughout the talk. Uh, this is mostly my personal 
comments, but also just sort of how our team, our Colombian research team feels about these issues in the context of this project. And I want to also provide a few warnings. Um, these expeditions did include the collection of specimens. Um, I'm happy to discuss that a little bit more, but I won't spend a lot of time necessarily talking about that part of the expedition. I'm happy to answer questions at the end. Also, as I said, this is not going to be a science -y talk, and so I will not be presenting uh, results of, of these expeditions. Um, and although I tried to make this talk uh, bilingual by translating a lot of the text on my slides, it is um, sometimes incomplete. And so I apologize if you're following the texts in Spanish, it's, um, it's maybe incomplete in some slides. So I want to start by telling you a little bit about the historical expeditions from the American Museum of Natural History. And so in between 1911 and 1915, uh, researchers, uh, naturalists at that time from the American Museum of Natural History in New York traveled to Colombia to study distributions of birds there. They did eight expeditions throughout Colombia and they visited 74 localities. These expeditions were led by Frank Chapman, who is um, known as one of the early um, naturalists to, to uh, push ornithology and sort of like encourage people to, to study birds. And the idea that Chapman had was that he would study the birds in Colombia so that he could better understand the distribution of birds in South America. So it was very much about um, biodiversity and biogeography instead of just like really trying to describe new species. In these expeditions that, um, that went on throughout these years, they collected close to 16,000 bird specimens uh, of about almost 1300 bird species. And to put it in context, Colombia has, um, there was just a new paper published today that updated the, the list of Colombian birds to 1,966. Uh, as you probably know, this is more birds than any other country in the world. And so you can see from these uh, numbers that Chapman and his team really did a very thorough survey of um, Colombia's birds. And it is one of the most complete surveys of Colombia's birds that we have even to date. So this is to highlight the importance of these historical expeditions. In these expeditions, they, um, they described nine new species to science and more than 100 new subspecies, even though this wasn't like really the goal. They did visit lots of places throughout the Andes, um, and they, this led to the discovery of, um, of new species. And so in these places, you can see in this map sort of like the size of the circles and the bigger the circle, the more specimens they collected. So you can see in different places, they stayed different amounts of time. And so they didn't collect like in the, with the same effort throughout, um, throughout the country. Okay, here are some pictures. I just wanna show you kind of what, what this looked like for Chapman and his team. This is uh, Fuertes here on the left and Chapman on the right. And you can see that what really uh, amazes me is that these people used to go to these tropical countries that are very hot and very humid, dressed in suits. Um, and they would, I guess, shoot the birds uh, and collect them dressed in suits, which was incredible. But also to highlight that they were um, collecting these birds and preparing the skins in the field. So they would spend a lot of the time at night and during the day preparing the skins and packing them so that they could bring them all back to New York. So all of these 16,000 specimens live in New York City. So here you can see um, on the left is Chapman, Frank Chapman, um, the leader of the expeditions. He has his shotgun, which was the main uh, mechanism used to collect birds back then. And on the right, you see them there uh, sort of on a table in a probably in a finca in a place um, preparing the skins of the birds that they collected that day. Chapman was the only one in the expeditions that had a camera. And so we have some pictures um, that were taken back in the 1900s. Um, and one of the things that our team has tried to do is figure out exactly where those pictures were taken. And we are going back to those places, not only to resurvey the birds, but also to take pictures. And so you can see here an example of um, an area in Tolima, in a place in Colombia. You can see in the 1911 picture, it's completely covered by forest. Uh, okay, and then these circles are pointing out some of the changes that have happened in 110 years. So in the picture on the right, which uh, we took in 2019, the team took, you can see already that there's been a lot of habitat loss. So these orange circles are sort of like showing where you've lost uh, forest. And then in the blue circle is the glacier Santa Isabel, which you can see in the 1911 picture, it's like completely white covered in snow. 
And in the 2019 picture, you can't even see it because all that snow has already melted. So there's already visible change in not just the land cover, but also the climate. And so this, um, these two da data sets of like the historic expeditions and the modern resurface that we're doing allow for this uh, incredible opportunity to integrate the two data sets of Colombian birds to assess the impacts of a century of land cover change and climate change on um, the diversity of the species. So what species were there before, what species are there now, but also the genomics of these species, because we have the specimens, we can do genomic analysis to see if throughout the century and due to land cover and climate change, there has been an erosion or a decrease in genetic diversity. So more genetically diverse populations are healthier and can better respond to, um, to change. And then of course, uh, by understanding what has happened to the birds in 100 years, we can better plan conservation actions that would prevent extinctions um, in the present in what has already happened, but also towards the future in understanding how the changes to the landscape um, affect bird populations. And so the other power, um, kind of like powerful thing of this data set is, uh, is twofold. The first is that because we have expeditions from places that are very different from each other, so different ecosystems in different regions, different biogeographical regions of Colombia, we have a diverse set of species and ecologies. So we have species that are forest interior species, we have species that prefer open habitats, we have species that are frugivorous, species that eat insects, species that have small ranges, species that have big ranges. So this diversity allows us to really understand how land cover and climate change impact different types of species and also different type of functional groups. So like the ones that eat insects, the ones that prefer to live under the canopy. Um, and so that's like sort of the power of having like diversity of, of uh, ecosystems that we study. And then the second powerful tool that we have is that the sites that we selected have um, distinct land cover change trajectories. This means that there are sites like the first one you see here that used to be forest a hundred years ago, and it still is forest. So we can see what has happened to those birds if the ecosystem remained the same. We can also, we also have sites that went from being forest to being fragmented, so being cut into little pieces. We have sites that went from being completely covered by a forest to having no forest at all, so complete deforestation. And we even have some sites that used to be more fragmented than they are now and have sort of recovered. And so these different trajectories allow us to understand how um, when we change the landscape in different ways, the birds respond to that in changing what species are there and how many, um, how many individuals are of a different, of, um, of each species. And so here um, is a map of all the places where we have done resurvey. So these are actually the places where our team has gone back to study the birds between 2019 and 2020. Um, and you can see sort of like there are some symbols that are on the map um, that show you the places. And then on, on the left, there is a figure that shows where those places fall in terms of elevation and in terms of human disturbance. And so in orange, you can see um, the historical kind of point in time and then in blue, the modern point in time. And so you see some places have gone from uh, less human disturbance to more human disturbance. Most of them have that, but others have changed very little in the human disturbance. Um, so these are the places that haven't changed that much. And the other power that we have is that we have sites that are throughout the elevational gradient. So we have everything from a lowland um, forest, think like the Amazonian forest, but it's actually in the Chocó in the west in the western um, and, and Andes of Colombia. And then we have places that are all the way to high elevation, um, so high Andean forest. And so in these elevational belts, we can actually see the the impacts of climate change on these species. Okay, and so as I said, I don't wanna focus so much on, on the results of the expeditions. And this is sort of like, not because I don't wanna share them with you, but because we're still working on, um, on analyzing the data that we've collected in the expeditions. But instead, I also wanna highlight um, why we did these resurveys in a different way than how they were done before. Um, I want to highlight that these expeditions, these historical expeditions, are of course framed in um, a history of colonialism of countries from the global north um, going to places uh, in the global south to study the biodiversity, but to study it in a way that didn't involve the local communities and that didn't necessarily benefit 
the local communities or local researchers that were there at the time. And so one of the most important things for us is the team of expeditioners. And uh, you can see here a picture of the team that, um, that Chapman, uh, Frank Chapman led in one of the expeditions. Um, you can see them here um, riding a, it was like a sort of train that existed back in, in, in the day. Um, you can see all of them are foreign white men. These are the people that were leading the expedition, collecting the birds, and then, of course, as I said, taking all the birds to New York. And then you can see in this picture, you can see a local person. Uh, but this local person is not at the same level of being part of this expedition, but instead is just a helper in this expedition. And in this case, really just like uh, someone helping with the logistics. One thing that we are sort of unable to prove, but that we suspect is that the expeditioners from the American Museum probably had a lot of help from local people in, you know, where finding the species, but also maybe collecting the individual um, specimens that they had. And these contributions are not acknowledged in any of the literature that describe these expeditions. Um, here's a picture of one of our expeditionary teams. And uh, before we go into any expedition, we pay care of per pay very careful attention to how we craft our team. And we have sort of certain criteria. The first criteria is that our teams are gender balanced. Um, you probably know from history that females have not been highlighted as uh, expeditioners. And it's hard for us to sort of see ourselves in the expeditioners of the past. And I'll touch a little bit more on this uh, further down, but there are very few female expeditioners that are, um, have made it to the books of history. So we do a team that is gender balanced. Uh, our team is also have um, composed of local students that are from the region where we're doing the expedition. So that part of the team changes every time we move expeditions. And this is because we want to acknowledge the knowledge that these students have, but we also want to provide them with an opportunity to get training um, with experienced ornithologists that come from um, sort of the best universities in Colombia. And so these expeditions of 10 days provide an amazing opportunity to just learn all these techniques from people that do them all the time. So 50% of them are local students and then 50% are sort of experienced scientists that are from the project. Um, and you can see some of them in the picture. And then also we have uh, local guides and the local guides uh, come with us to set up the, the mist nets to do the work, but also sort of participate in the expedition um, in, in similar ways than, than we do as scientists. Okay, and then expeditions before, um, you know, a century ago are what I would call helicopter expeditions in which experts from the global north come to places in the global south, you know, extract the specimens and then take them away. And it's almost like once they leave, it's like the communities are sometimes confused at what just happened. They don't know what the impact of this data is going to be. They don't see um, what, what was the result of this, not even like the list of what species were there, and they're not involved in the process. Um, so that has, of course, a lot of um, issues uh, socially. And so we have tried to design an expedition that involves the local community and shows respect for them from the beginning. So the first thing that we do for expeditions is that we do a sort of pre-expedition outing. In this pre-expedition, we send um, some of our team members and specifically people that are trained in sort of so the social scientists. So in this case, um, Nelsi is the researcher who's an anthropologist, biologist, and she would um, lead the communication with the, the local communities. Our expeditions manager is Juliana Soto, who also had a lot of um, experience working with local communities would go in this pre-expedition with a local ornithologist. And so they would go um, sort of in advance to do several things. The first thing is get permission. We have to understand that we're studying the birds in territories that are not ours. And the first thing is to ask permission to study those birds. The second thing is sort of to identify the people and the stakeholders that we will be involving in the expedition as guides, as cooks, as students, and then as people that participate in the workshops that we do with the communities. Um, and so sort of to set all that up and to do all the logistics of the expedition. The second thing that we do is that um, besides just collecting the specimens, we do a very thorough um, survey of the birds, including uh, point counts and audio surveys. And so there is before the expedition itself, 
there's a team of researchers that includes um, local bird watchers and ornithologists that do point counts throughout the same places um, to, to get sort of like complement what we do during the expedition. Um, then we have the expedition, which lasts for 10 days. And uh, as I said, in these expeditions, we are collecting specimens. And this is so that these specimens can stay in the museum and can become um, resources for students in the present, but also in the future. And I'll talk a little bit more about this. And then the last thing we do, like we, of course, finish the expedition, go back to our places, we analyze the data, we think about all the things that we found, and then we go back to the same places. And we involve the community in workshops in which we tell them what we have found, but we also learn from them about what they know about their birds, because we're trying to understand what happened in 100 years. There are elders that have been there almost as long as um, the time when like Chapman was there or they heard from their grandparents uh, and all this history is important and all the knowledge of their birds. So we, we go and do these workshops and um, they do um, led by Nelsi or anthropologists, they do sort of community uh, mapping where they have these like stickers of all the different species and they put them in places where they see them very often. And they tell us sort of when is it that they see these birds and what changes they have noticed over time. Okay, and then the other thing that's important to note is that um, because you, you know we've come a long way, like kind of like scientifically, there are difference in, in the methods that we have used, and this is what has made it really challenging to compare sort of historical to um, modern expeditions. And so historically, um, there was collection of birds using shotguns, and and there are a lot of unknown biases. So we don't know if maybe Chapman and his team were trying to get only males, or maybe only species that they didn't have in the museum. Or maybe, you know, there's biases just from like the species that are easier to shoot compared to something else. Um, and importantly, all of the specimens, like I said before, are housed at the American Museum of Natural History in New York, even to this day. Um, the methods that we do in our expeditions, um, as I said in the slide before, they sort of include point counts, um, standardized sampling. So we use the exact same effort in every expedition site that we go. We have a protocol of how we do things. We have published this protocol so that not only do we do expeditions like that, but we provide this, um, this like standard protocol. So anyone who can wants to do expeditions somewhere else can use the same protocol. Um, instead of using shotguns, we use mist nets. So these are nets that are used to capture the birds. Um, we have also criteria for how many individuals we collect, um, and we try to collect as you know few as possible. But um, it is sort of uh, part of part of the part of the expedition. We do uh, audio recordings, and most importantly, all of these specimens um, are housed in the museum of the Universidad Nacional in Bogota. This means that these specimens of Colombian birds will have will be accessible to Colombians not just now but also in the future. Okay, and then um, the other thing I want to point out is that uh, though collecting birds sounds um, really hard to do and, and we don't enjoy it ourselves, um, it is important because it allows us to have a lot of information for a bird that we cannot have just from observing it or taking a picture of it. And so one thing that has been important about having Chapman's collections uh, in the American Museum is that we can go back and take genetic samples of those birds from 100 years ago and compare it to the genetic samples of the birds currently. And this is something we still haven't done, but we have the opportunity of doing it because of these specimens that live there. For this expedition, we have tried to take as much data as we can um, to take advantage of this opportunity to study the birds. And we have taken data that we sometimes don't know what we're gonna be doing with, but that we know that in the future, there might be a student that comes with a question that will need the, those data. And so we take flash frozen samples of blood, we take pectoral tissue, audio recordings, the, as the specimens are mounted in different ways. And so this is just to allow for um, answering research questions that maybe we haven't even thought of yet. Okay, so I wanna sort of like take you um, to the field a little bit and just um, show you kind of how we plan these expeditions. This was the pilot expedition team. Um, and I just wanna point out, this is sort of the, the sort of data that we're gonna get out of this. And I just wanna give you the example of a pilot expedition that was done in 2019. So basically um, we have the data from 1911 that was 216 species and we sampled in 2019, found 238 species. And we found that of those 160 are common. So they were there hundred years ago and they're there now. 
One thing that's really hard to say is that if we found the species but Chapman and his team didn't, we really can't say it wasn't there because they weren't looking as thoroughly as we were. But if they have uh, a, a species they reported and we didn't find it, it's almost certain that it's not there anymore. So we can think about what are the species that have disappeared from these landscapes. And in the case of the pilot expedition, there is a very clear trend. This is um, data that's already been published, led by Camila Gomez. And basically, this, the types of species that has suffered the most due to land cover change are large frugivores, so big birds that eat fruit, migratory species, um, like this um, black Burnian warbler you see here, also understory insectivorous birds, so the ones that like the kind of like dark under the forest and eat insects, and woodpeckers. So we're also already seeing a pattern of species that are sensitive to these land cover changes, and those are the ones that are um, providing very unique functions to the forest, like these large seeds that this um, this fruit crow disperses, no one else can dis disperse because of their size. Okay, and so this is just a little example of how these expeditions go and how we find the exact places where they were. And so you can see here in sort of like the typed uh, letters, these are excerpts from the book written by Chapman where he would describe very um, careful how, kind of like where they did the expedition. So we try to find the exact same place that they went to. Uh, and sometimes it's really hard, uh, but in this case, there is a picture you can see here on the left, and it was a Camino Real, so like one of these trails that people would use before there were cars. And on the right, you can see our team walking the exact same trail that Chapman and his team walked a century ago. And this trail is very steep. It has these rocks that were very slippery, um, but that's how we were able to find like the exact place to, to run the, the modern resurvey. So this is the team. Um, you can see they're all wearing face masks. This was uh, an exp the expeditions happened between 2020 and 2021. So this was in the height of the pandemic. We had this whole logistics of like testing everyone for COVID before they arrived and sort of providing a bubble, but also being very careful to not spread COVID to the local communities where we were doing our expeditions. So these are some of the sites and you can see um, sort of on the left, this is the Camino Real. So like the trail that um, they followed um, before. And then to the right, you can see the landscape. And one thing I want you to see in the picture on the top is you can see the tent there, it's like in white. And then far away, you can see the city. And so I wanna point out that some of these expeditions are not in very remote locations. And that is um, of particular importance because this is where we're having a lot of kind of human disturbance and we need to understand what's happening to the birds. So it doesn't mean that we're like necessarily going to far away places, um, but just like studying what has happened in places that are even close to us. And of course I couldn't help but to put some bird pictures here um, because you came for the birds. And so here are some of the, some of the species that were um, surveyed here in the kind of high, high elevation Andean forest. And these are some pictures of the workshops that Nelsi and the social team led uh, specifically with this community. And so you can see um, we've done it with different ranges of ages. So like adult elders, but also children. And these are the pictures of the maps that they make. So these stickers, they're able to like put the specific um, stickers in places. And so it's almost like community, community mapping um, with, um, yeah, with sort of like facilitation from Nelsi. Okay, and so here's another one of the expeditions. And this is just, as I said, this, I was thinking of this uh, more of like a storytelling talk, but this is when we went to Onda. Onda is a place in Colombia that's very hot and very humid. And the picture I showed before of the team, um, Chapman's team is in Onda, which is um, incredible to me that they were wearing suits when it's like a hundred degrees and like 200% humidity, uh, but here they are. and. Our team went to the exact same hacienda. So there is a, a ranch that's been owned by, by the same family since um, Chapman and his team went and now that we are back. So this is one of the places that has seen the least amount of change over time in the sort of land cover, but there has been an increase in the cattle grazing around these areas in the dry forests of Colombia. And so this is a place that will tell us a lot about, even if you have the same um, sort of cover from a scene from a satellite, the use has changed and how do birds respond to that? Um, this is a team for this expedition. And then this is the landscape of the place that um, was being 
studied, um, you can see it's sort of a, a very unusual like outcrop, like rocky outcrop that's actually very close to the town. And it has some of the best conserved dry forests of Colombia. Dry forests are the most threatened ecosystem of Colombia. And so these uh, information from this particular site is gonna give us a lot of insight into their vulnerability to land cover and climate change. And um, one thing to, that I think it's, it's, it's just like um, incredible for us is to be able to go to these exact same places. And so sometimes we're able to locate the exact building where Chapman and his team stayed. In the case of um, El Consuelo, um, one of the people who were our guides, um, his family was involved in El Consuelo like a long time ago when Chapman and his team came. And so we were able to like locate the exact building and here is the team. Um, they stayed actually in that same building throughout this expedition um, to do the resurvey of, of this site in El Consuelo. And um, here are the birds from the dry forests of Colombia. So we have mannequins, um, tree creepers, um, what do you call them? Puff, um, puff birds, um, tanagers, ant birds. Okay, and then I wanted to just give you a little sneak peek uh, of something that will be coming very soon from us. And it's that when we were doing the research to um, study the, the place in Onda, we, we found something that made us very, very um, excited and interested. Um, Juliana Soto, who's our expeditions manager, was um, sort of reading about what are the collections that were used to, for, by Chapman to study the Colombian birds. And in that, she found the description of a collection made by Mrs. Care. So the first thing to notice is that it says Mrs. And so we couldn't believe it because we've uh, been taught um, sort of about expeditions and naturalists, and it's always been men um, that are featured. And so this was incredibly exciting to us, uh, especially because our team was composed of a lot of ornithology, um, ornithologists who were women. And this sort of inspired this kind of like side, um, side expedition that I'll talk very briefly about, but just to say that um, we kind of started digging more into Elizabeth Kerr and like who she was, what, were his, what was her legacy to ornithology and why does she not, why is she never mentioned in any of the accounts of historical um, ornithology in Colombia? And so with help with, from the American Museum of Natural History, they shared with us some correspondence between Elizabeth Kerr and Chapman. Turns out um, Elizabeth um, Kerr was a bird collector, bird and mammal collector, and she traveled throughout Colombia collecting birds and would sell them to American Museum of Natural History. So we're talking the 1900s, a woman um, carrying a shotgun by herself in the Colombian jungles. Um, and this was incredible to us. And so we started, of course, we read all her letters and, and we have a, a paper that's led by Juliana that's about to come out very soon, telling the story of Elizabeth Kerr, highlighting her role um, in the 1900s and also highlighting the role of women currently as expeditioners. And one of the sort of uh, things that we did to honor this legacy and sort of um, also model a little bit of how expeditions can be in the future is that we ran an all female uh, mini expedition in honor of care. Um, this because we want the girls and women who are starting in science to see themselves in these expeditionary teams and to know that they also can be um, expeditioners themselves. And so we're not saying necessarily that teams have to be uh, composed of only females, but instead that we can, we wanted to highlight the fact that women are also sort of strong and um, able to do these expeditions. And um, what we get from diverse teams uh, in many ways, but gender diverse teams is incredible in terms of how they work and sort of how, how much innovation can come from a team that's this diverse. Okay, and so as I said, um, I'm not gonna necessarily um, disclose a lot of the results. And this is mostly not because I don't wanna tell you, but because they're not ready yet. We've had a lot of um, issues with trying to compare kind of current expeditions to historical data. And so, like I said, in, in the historical expeditions, there is um, a lot of biases that we don't know about. Like the, we don't, sometimes don't know for how long they stayed in a place or how long during the day did they go out collecting or what were they aiming to collect. So it's really, you, we have to be very responsible in the way that we compare that to an expedition that is as complete as the one that we run um, in the resurveys. But, um, 
in the expeditions that we have done, we have samples for 655 bird species. And so this is about 34% of Colombia's birds. And they are sort of uh, from a different suite of, um, of course, like identities of like, you know, species, but also different trophic guilds, different habitat preferences, and like all the places that are sort of throughout Colombia. And so what we want to do is to try to understand how human impacts from land cover and climate change have affected not only what species that are there, but also what are the sort of functional, how the functional diversity has changed over time. And so we want to understand if when you lose these sort of large bodied frugivores, you're losing all this function of seed disperser for large seeds. And so the impacts are not only on the identity of what species disappear or appear, um, because of land cover change, but also what the role of those species is in the landscape. I want to highlight that these expeditions, um, though they were um, put together in, in an effort to sort of have a scientific understanding of how birds have changed, we found that the most powerful part of the expeditions um, was the local social impact that they had. Because the communities were involved from the beginning, because we had a team that was led by people who um, were experts in social science, we were able to have an impact uh, at the community level. So throughout these seven expeditions, there were about 25 workshops with people from multiple ages. So depending on where we were doing it, sometimes it was um, workshops with children, sometimes it was workshops with elders or workshops with adults. Um, there were trainings in which ornithologists came back to the places to teach the communities how to monitor their birds themselves so that they don't have to wait for people like us or foreign people to go there to monitor their birds. Um, throughout this process, because it involves collections, there's been intensive training of museum um, skin preparation taxidermy um, to students uh, locally, but also in Bogota in the museum where all these specimens are. And we, had reached, we have reached about 600 people with this effort, just like directly. The other sort of important part of this project is that because we have tried to um, craft our team very carefully and sort of the strategy that we use for expeditions, it's had a bigger kind of a broader social impact. So this project was actually featured uh, in the front page of the New York Times, which was incredible. Um, in one of the expeditions that went to Barbacoas, Nariño, which is in the southwestern part of Colombia. And um, this article, you, you can look it up and read it if you want. It's very interesting and very well written about these expeditions and the ways in which we envision as global South scientists, we would like expeditions to happen in our territories. And then the sort of like this impact and like the engagement with the media has um, been also very well received in, at the national scene. And so there's um, the understanding of that now we have the capacity in these places like Colombia to do the science locally and to empower those scientists there um, so to sort of like decolonize the science and instead provide these resources and contribute um, to, to the experts who are in, in, in the places. Um, and so I think like having these discussions, although it can be very controversial and difficult, is important in how, how we move forward. And that's sort of why I wanted to, to do this talk more about that and not so much about the data. The data you can read in the, in the scientific papers when we publish it, but I think about or, um, or approach to this or, or vision as global South scientists and how we would like these expeditions to happen. We want them to happen, of course, in tandem with the American Museum of Natural History. We still collaborate with them. They're our collaborators, but this is done by Colombian scientists, Colombian institutions that are um, sort of empowering the scientists locally. Okay, and so the sort of like main takeaways that I want you to, um, to remember from these expeditions and sort of how they've been designed is that um, we're trying to do, to understand how birds have changed over time by using data. So we want, we have this incredible opportunity to compare historical to modern data. And that's what we wanna kind of extract the information from the birds themselves. Like how have these um, communities changed over 100 years and what can we learn from that to prevent future extinctions? Also important to highlight that this is knowledge that is co-constructed. Uh, with the local communities and that leaves increased local capacity for them to monitor their birds and to also recognize that their knowledge, uh, though it's a different type of knowledge, is also important for us as scientists. 
The other thing is that um, the data that we produce is open. It's all on eBird. It's all uploaded into repositories. So other scientists can also ask different questions using the same data. Um, and the specimens, of course, are housed in a museum um, to which everyone has access. And then finally, to say that we do believe firmly that these expeditions and any sort of field work that you do in any place um, should have uh, kind of authentic collaborations with local people and sort of a be very mindful of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And so far, so this is how we used to study birds, you know, in 1900s, it was um, sort of these helicopter expeditions from far away in 2020, 2021, this is how we're doing them now. Um, and who knows what brings um, from the future. This is a picture of my daughter actually, um, who hopefully will become a bird watcher and do the, the next set of, of expeditions. Okay, and I just wanna, I wanted to end so we have some time for questions. I wanna thank all of the team of the Columbia Resurvey team, all the institutions that have been part of this project because this, as I said, is sort of a group effort and I'm just sort of a, a spokesperson in this moment. And then I wanted to tell you that there is a website that you can go and read more about the project. And there's also a documentary um, that's actually really cool. It's not very long, uh, it's in Spanish but you can maybe practice your Spanish, um, but it has also like incredible kind of scenery. So I invite you to, to check it out. And um, yeah, thank you. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Natalia. That was a great talk and I'm glad we made it all the way through. Um, <laughs> I saw that we had a number of questions. So I do want to go ahead and jump right into those. The first question I'm seeing is um, why did that first expedition only cover Western Colombia, not all of Colombia. Yeah, this is um, a good question. You uh, you probably mean like the historic expeditions. Yeah, we wonder the same because they're sort of very. Um, oh my god, low power. My phone is uh, also in low power. Um, they, I think, what happened was that that those were the places that had more access, and so Colombia's sort of colonization of like you know kind of. Um, through like towns and human settlements uh, was all throughout the Andes. And so this is where I think they had the connections to be able to go there and sort of transport themselves. Whereas the Amazon and all the Orinoco, so towards the East and South, it was very impenetrable at, at that point. Um, it still is some of it. So I think that's that's sort of the, the main reason. But this is speculation because we don't know. <laughs> yeah, no, but that makes sense though. Uh, another question we have is, uh, do you know um, what Colombian ornithologists of that era of Chapman, what kind of work they were doing? Yeah, this is a great question. Thank you for that. So there are um, a few that are mentioned and then we know from other texts that participated um, or had communicated with Chapman and other foreign scientists at the time. There is a very, um, a very good book by a Colombian um, social scientist um, called Birds of an Empire. And it talks about these relationships. And so we know that there were some local um, naturalists who also were doing work that, that were not like directly involved in the expeditions, but maybe would give tips to Chapman of where to go. Um, so that, but they're not recognized in the, in the book where Chapman describes all the expeditions. Okay. And then uh, were your point counts at the same locations as that historical expedition as well? Yeah, we try to put the point counts in the same place. It's really hard to tell exactly where they went. Um, so they will talk about where they stayed the nights um, and how many nights, but we don't know exactly how far away they walked. And so we created the point count sort of with that locality in the middle and sort of trying to span a little bit of the region. Um, and they are designed uh, with occupancy models in mind. So they're sort of separated by the same distance and uh, they're very standardized but it's really hard to know that we're exactly in the same place sometimes. Great. Um, and then do your collections and Chapman's collections have different male to, fail, to female specimen ratios? Oh, interesting. Uh, I don't think that we've looked into that, but I, we were very cognizant in our collections to, um, to collect uh, females and immatures. And so I would suspect um, that ours has a bigger kind of diversity of ages because males are more easily detectable in the field as if you're a bird watcher, you know. And so perhaps they, they were easier to shoot. Um, whereas in misnets that you don't have that bias of um, detectability. 
yeah that'd be interesting to to find out yeah um and then uh someone also said it's possible that earlier expedition the historical one um could shoot birds higher in the canopy than you can capture via mist nets um what do you think i mean you're also collecting so maybe there isn't as much of a bias there no, they're right. They're right that, that mist nets kind of collect a, a certain um, kind of fraction of the forest and it doesn't get to the canopy. And so how we try to account for that is that we do the point counts that include sort of like um, audio and visual from like throughout the, the forest spectra. And also during the expeditions, we keep a list of all the birds that we hear and see, even if we didn't collect them. And so for a lot of the, bird, the species, we don't have specimens, but we have data that they're there due to the point counts, uh, the surveys, and we also put like audio recorders in these places. So then we complement the mist nets with that. Okay, and then um, staying on that science realm here, do you think you'll be able to tease out the effects of habitat destruction from the effects of climate change? Oh, wow, <laughs> this is a really good question. I feel like my preliminary exam here. Um, I would say probably not, but what we can do that we're going to, like how we're going to try to tackle that is by taking these elevational um, data from different elevations to see there might be like high elevation places that have maintained the same uh, land cover. And so we have a, a paramo that we haven't resurveyed, but we are planning to resurvey. So the land cover hasn't changed. And the only thing that changed has changed has been the climate. So this would be the one place where we can really tease out these effects. But um, as the person who has probably knows, it's really difficult um, to tease apart these effects. Um, I would say, however, that in the case of most of these places, it has to do more with just like severe habitat loss. Um, and so even though climate change plays a role, I think the, the most important thing is that the forest has just been lost or fragmented over a hundred years. Yeah. Oh, wow. Uh, we'll be looking forward to hearing more about that as well. Um, okay, and then we have another question about, um, do you know if uh, shooting the birds, especially on the historical expeditions, caused damage to the specimen samples that they collected? Um, I think sometimes, but I was really surprised that it doesn't damage them as much as one would think. Like you would think like they explode when the, when they get shot or something, but, um, it's, it's really not like that. They even like shot hummingbirds and like smaller birds that are still like mounted, um, kind of like really well. So I would say not, not as much as you would expect. Hmm. And then uh, here's kind of a fun question. Is it possible the men just wore suits for the photos and then changed into more casual, cooler wear after? <laughs> Oh, great question. Um, I don't think so. I think that's what they were because um, these pictures were taken like in the field where, I mean, I don't think they would like staging the, the photos um, of what, yeah, I, I would, I would say they would just like, that's just the, what were the clothes that were av available back then, but also kind of speculation because we don't know if they're just like staging the photos so that we could present them today at the talk. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, and then um, in the photo of Elizabeth Kerr, is that a snakeskin? And maybe I can pull that up if we don't have that right away. Yes. But yeah, it was snakeskin. it was a snakeskin. Um, so yeah, Elizabeth Kerr um, collected birds, mammals, insects, um, and I guess also snakes because in the in the legend of the picture it says that she's posing with one of her specimens, and so she probably collected that snake. Um, besides the kind of legacy to Ornithology, I didn't talk much about this, but if you want, like, as I said, there's a paper coming out very soon, but she um, collected the, the holotype for a species that was new to science, a tinamu, that's called the Choco tinamu, that's actually named after her. Um, Chapman did this um, thing where she, he named it after her. And then she also um, has the holotype of a lot of new subspecies. And this is the case also for mammals. So there are uh, monkey species of monkeys and squirrels that were described based on specimens that Elizabeth Kerr collected. Um, I don't know about the snake. I, if, if we, we didn't find um, too much information about kind of um, snake specimens, yeah. Yeah, really cool. Thanks for sharing about her too. Awesome to hear about that. Um, do you have hope that further habitat destruction can be controlled or mitigated to protect bird populations and species? <laughs> yes, that's what drives me every day. I do have hope. Um, I think in places like Colombia, there is still 
um, a lot to be done. There's a, still a lot to be protected. So for instance, some of these places that we surveyed have maintained the same habitat cover from a hundred years ago. And even in places that are very fragmented, sometimes these species sort of hang on to this or can recolonize if there, um, if there is like reconnection of fragments to bigger forest patches. And so nature is very resilient. Um, I think that this information can really guide conservation decisions in showing like what are these impacts and how we can mitigate them in the future. So maintaining connectivity, maintaining patches that are large, planting agricultures in, in agriculture in ways that are friendly to um, biodiversity. Um, but I do think there is hope, yes. That's why we're here, right? We have yeah. to have hope to keep continuing <laughs> yeah. this kind of work. Um, have any of the species disappeared or are there any pleasant surprises or reasons for optimism in the data so far? Yes, um, many species have disappeared. Um, and so, as I said, the ones that have disappeared are sort of large frugivores. So um, the fruit crow, but there's also guans, curacaos, toucans that are in the historical specimens that are not there now. In places like lowland, um, lowland kind of moist forest, the species that have disappeared are mostly insectivorous birds from the understory. So what I call the ant things, ant wrens, ant birds, um, ant pittas, all these kind of like um, the, the species that really like kind of dark, well-preserved forests, those ones are some of the first ones to disappear because they're very sensitive to habitat change. Um, as for pleasant surprises, um, there was uh, in the female expedition, we, we worked in a place that was very disturbed, um, it had lots of crops and just like very little bit of forest. And we did find um, an endemic species that we didn't really, I mean, it's, it, the distribution is there, but we didn't expect to find in these little fragments, a little ant bird. Um, so that was kind of like an exciting thing. We, we found a, a male and a female that, that lived there. And in that same place, there was another endemic um, barbet um, that also lived there. So there are still some, um, you know, the, these like the species that linger even in places that are very fragmented. Okay, nice. Um, and then another question. So um, were the pre-expedition point counts at the same places as the current expedition? Um, so I guess- Oh, I think, they're, I think they mean the point counts and the expedition. So we do the point right. counts and the expeditions. So the expeditions um, are more local because we can't move all of the equipment. So we we do the point counts sort of taking that as a center, but then they, the point counts go like on different directions. Um, and then the expedition itself, it depends on the site. In some sites, it would be just in one place, we stay the 10 days, but more often we would have like at least two different places. So we would do for like five days and then move to another place. And so we try to keep like the same region, sort of like locality, but not necessarily the exact same spot. Though the, at least one point count would be in like the same spot and then other point counts that are like nearby. Okay, great. And now it is 7 p.m. right now. So, and I know that your phone is low on battery About here. So I don't want to just, uh, you know, have you completely um, use up all your juice here. Um, we do have other questions, but I can email them to you and maybe I can send those out later to people after. Um, but yeah, is that okay with you? Does that sound good to you? Yeah, that's perfect. So I think um, I just noticed that Juliana, who is one of the team members, Team members was in the audience and she was she posted the um the website and the documentary is also in the chat and so you can also feel free to like check it out and then if you have more questions you feel free to email me um and ask me more and yeah thanks so much and i'm sorry about the um, conditions under <laughs> but at least we did it yeah yes yes success um, thank you so much for, you know, being such a trooper about this and for, again, your great talk, sharing your great work. And thank you, everybody, for joining us. Mm -hmm.